Yes, would you ask Mr. Cross Smith to come back in, please? Right, Mr. Cross Smith, ready to carry on? I am. Yep. Good. Thank you very much. Yes, Miss Grange. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you, Mr. Cross Smith. What I want to do now in this next phase of the questioning is examine in more detail the design development process as, as it evolved. And if we can start in July 2012, if we can go to MAX 50147. This is going to be some notes, yes, from, we can see, meeting number five, made by Studio E, recording a meeting on the 18th of July 2012. And in paragraph 30 of your statement, we don't need to go to it, you tell us that it was at this meeting that Max Fordham was asked to review a specification for the smoke control system prepared for the TMO in October 2011 by ACOM. Is that right? Uh, yes, that's correct. And we can see this if we go to page three. Under the third paragraph uh, of, of that middle section with the heading services... We can see it says MF Max Fordham to review upgrade to smoke extract system as per ACOM specification circulated previously. It is intended this work is included in the scope of this project. Max Fordham X over to review and report back. Do you see that there? I do. So is that, um, you, you explained earlier that this piece of work was effectively added on as the project began to develop. Was this the point at which you were asked to, first asked to start looking at the smoke control system? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. And if we could go to MAX 403007, we can see this is an email from you to Claire Barker of Exova, copying in Mr. McQuatt at Max Fordham, and you say, Afternoon, Claire. You mentioned at the meeting on Thursday that you'd like to see a copy of the specification for the smoke extract system for Grenfell Tower. The specification I've attached below is a previous spec for Grenfell from another engineering firm. We'll be incorporating it into our spec as part of the refurbishment works with the addition of extending it to include the additional residential units that are being created. So is this you sending a copy of the ACOM report to Exova? Is that right? That's correct, yeah. Yes. Now, at this stage, what was your understanding of the state of the existing smoke control system within Grenfell Tower? Um, I don't recall without reference to any, yes, any notes see. as to what my understanding was at this point. Um, And at this point, is it right that what Max Fordham were doing was reviewing the ACOM specification with a view to then developing some designs to go forward in its further staged reports on the project? Yes, I'd note that Andrew was leading the, was leading the design at this point, so my involvement was somewhat reduced. Yes. Um, but my understanding was that we had been asked to incorporate the improvement works that ACOM had previously um, designed for and provided a specification for within the works. I see, yes. And we, of course, would be reviewing that as to how it fit within the, the, the larger refurbishment works that were now being undertaken versus the previous point in time, which was the building was not being refurbished, but the smoke control system was. Yes, so the ACOM's proposal was for a standalone alteration to the smoke control system, and now what you're saying is the whole building was undergoing a refurbishment, yes? Yes, correct. Yeah. Now, you tell us in your statement, this is paragraph 30, again, we don't need to turn it up, that it was suspected that the current system may not operate as required during a fire within the building... Can you remember why you suspected that? Had you actually gone into the tower and, and had a look at it at that point? Again, I can't recall specifically when I became aware of that, um, but certainly quite early on during our, our initial inspection and site visit to the building, we noted that the system was a poor state of repair. Um, and again, without referring to my notes to get the, the precise chronology, I know that we were circulated a, 
a report from the TMO about a previous fire where the system hadn't operated as as um, as required. Yes, exactly. I'm just about to take you to that okay. now. So if we go to MAX 403154, and if we can start looking at page three of this chain, there's an email from Mr. Soons at the bottom of that page dated the 10th of September 2012. This is to Paul Dunkerton copying in Terry Ashton. And we can see that there was a query from Mr. Soons about whether the LFB had raised any concerns about the existing system that might have informed the ACOM proposal. And then we can see in reply, looking at page two, if we go up this, we can see that Miss Ray has said to Mr. Dunkerton, Janice Ray, Hi, Paul, as per our conversation just now, I've attached an email I sent to the LFB's fire safety officer following a fire in the common parts of Grenfell Tower in April 2010. Unfortunately, as I have outlined, the vents did not operate as required during this fire, which led to pressure on us from the LFB. And then she carries on. So, and you became aware of this uh, because this was forwarded on to you, I believe. Is okay. that correct? I mean, it looks familiar. Yes, thank you. Um, did that knowledge about the fact that the system was in a state of disrepair and hadn't worked correctly during a previous fire, including the vents not operating properly, did that influence the way you went about developing your design for the project? I don't think necessarily... It, I don't think it influenced how we went about the design of the project. Um, I think what it did was highlight that maintenance was not, planned maintenance was not being carried out properly at Grenfell. Um, but I don't think it would have impacted on our, on our design at all. Yes. Now, if we could look at another email, at MAX 403205, page 2. This is an email in September 2012 from Mr. McQuatt to Kate Cooney of Exova. And here he says, attached is a report that was produced by ACOM regarding the updating of the existing smoke ventilation system at Grenfell Tower. This work was never carried out as the TMO thought it would be better to do it in conjunction with the regeneration works. Therefore, the TMO passed this report on to us for it to be incorporated into our package. And then you, um, Mr. McQuatt says, we would be interested in any comment you may have before we start to incorporate it into our information. Now, can you help us? What role did Exova play in developing the design of the new system for, this, for the smoke control system at, at the tower? So Exova were the fire engineers yes. on the job. So their responsibility was the fire strategy. Um, and with that in mind, we would be steered very much by them um, in terms of which areas ought to be served by the smoke extracts or smoke control system. Um, and also in terms of some of the requirements for flow rates, et cetera, for the system, we would be steered by the fire engineer and the fire strategy for the building. Yes. But in practice, did you actually get that steer from Exova? How much guidance did you get from them on the proposals that you subsequently developed? Um, we certainly requested it at a number of points during the project. Yes. Um, and I believe we got some guidance from them. But I think in the end, we... I mean, we may come through this as you step through yes. the chronology, um, if that's the intent. But I think we began to rely somewhat more on PSB as a specialist designer rather than on Xova. That's not to say that we didn't include them, you know, within communication and request comment at certain points. Yes. Do you remember ever receiving comments uh, from Exova on the ACOM report? Um, I have a slight recollection that we did get a very high level, yes, this looks okay. Yes. Um, but I think that may have been the extent of it. Yes, thank you. Now, just looking at that ACOM proposal for a moment, if we could pull it up, it's at SEA 704.
This is um, that October 2011 document that was prepared for the TMO. You can see the date of it at the bottom. And if we go on to page uh, six, right at the bottom, under U, item U14, smoke extract control, there is a system description, um, and it describes um, the system. And if we can go over the page, let's talk about smoke dampers there. It then, in the second paragraph, said, in order to overcome these issues, the following works are required. Renovation of the dampers, conversion of the control system such that the fans start automatically, the addition of micro switches and a monitoring system, etc. And then it talks about renovation of the dampers and then conversion to automatic control of the extract fans. Do you see that at the bottom of the page? I do. Now, just in general, what was your understanding of how the existing system was supposed to work? Did you have an understanding of that? Yes. Um, I believe, I mean, it may help to, to turn down to the next section of this, but I believe my understanding was pretty similar to this, actually. Would you like me to... Yes, just yeah. explain in your own words, it, that would help us, what, how you understood the existing system to work. Okay. So the existing system, there was a smoke detector on each of the common lobbies throughout the tower. Um, on detection of smoke from any one of those detectors would activate the dampers on that floor only. So all dampers would normally be closed. Um, and then on detection of smoke within that, on that particular floor, the dampers on that specific floor would open. Um, there were four shafts, two to the north and two to the south. I can't recall which was supply and which was, was extract. Um, yeah. But the, the supply dampers um, would give a natural air path, so it's natural ventilation, no mechanical assistance um, for the air to, for supply air to enter the, the lobby. Yes. Um, and then on the other set of dampers across the lobby, um, that, would, that was the extract route, so that would go up to the, up to the top of the tower. Again, no mechanical assistance. Um, so there'd be dilution of the smoke, and then with the natural stack effect of effectively hot air rises, is a simplistic way of thinking about it, that the, the smoke would exit through the, yes. or be diluted, and some of it would exit through the extract shaft. Yes. And did you understand there to be a fireman's override function, which could provide some mechanical assistance to that natural ventilation system if the fire brigade chose to operate it? Yes, I did. So I would actually, our initial view and I think actually I should say um, I think Andrew's initial view because I think he did some more in-depth um, review of the existing system than I did initially yes um, was that it was mechanically assisted for extract only um, but then subsequently um, it was found that it was mechanically extracted for supply as well so there was yes. a set of supply fans um, within the podium le level which was an area that we previously we hadn't been able to get access to when doing our initial inspections which was I think why it took us a while to pick that up yes um, and then there was a set of extract fans uh, within the rooftop plant room. Yes. And that was activated by the fire brigade upon arrival if they deemed it necessary. Yes. They had no control over opening or closing any of the dampers on any of the floors. That was all manual. It wasn't, they weren't actuated in any way. Um, but what they could do is, is turn the fan set on or off. Yes. Thank you. Just while you're speaking, try not to speak too quickly, just okay. for the benefit I'll, of I'll the transcriber. But no, that's a very helpful explanation. Thank you. Um, and... You said it might help if we scroll down to see this proposal. Just in, in, in general terms, how, what did you understand this ACOM proposal to be suggesting in terms of improving the system? I mean, it would help if we could scroll down yeah, just to remind sorry. me. Um, Mr. Operator, if we could just scroll down the page. Is that the bit you wanted to look at? Um, yes. Okay, so my understanding from this specification is the intent was to ensure what was installed was operating effectively. Um, so some dampers would be, some or all dampers would be replaced as required. Um, and then the operation of the system would be automated such that on the detection of smoke in any one of the given lobbies, 
um, would also active would, would not only activate the the dampers to open on that lobby, but would also activate the supply and extract fan. Um, with that being a variation from the previous case, where the fire brigade would arrive and then decide whether to manually activate. It would automatically it would go automatically. into mechanical Correct. mode and automatically start supplying and extracting. Correct. Yes. And could you describe that as a push-pull system? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Now, you mention at paragraph 33 of your witness statement that um, Max Forder measured the shafts of the existing smoke control system early on in the project. Um, can you remember, wh why were you doing that? Why did you measure the shafts? Because that's the first thing that you would look at um, yes. if you were to look at. I think, as a general point, forgive me if I'm not particularly great with the building regulations, but I've been working within the US regulatory environment for the past five years almost exclusively, so I'm not as quick to refer to the, the correct part of building standards, so that's fine. forgive me for that. That's but um, within part B, for um, providing means of escape, which is where you would refer to initially for, for guidance on smoke extract and for smoke ventilation. Um, they have very clear guidance within there around expected shaft areas for both natural ventilation and mechanical systems. Yes. So as a first port, point of, of interest, it would be to measure what was there already to see if it was compliant. Yes. And um, did you ever consider um, whether that smoke control system was compliant with the standards that it was installed to originally? Did that question ever get raised within Max Vorden? Yes, it did. Um, I mean, it got raised right from the very beginning. Yes. Um, but I think we looked at it in detail later on. Um, I think when we... At the point where we were more involved with building control um, yes. and proving... Um, proving that the design proposal was an improvement over what was already there. We looked at it in quite some detail. So I personally looked at the building regulations um, for, that were in force in 1974. Um, I looked at GLC Section 20, so Greater London Council Section yes. 20. Um, there was a GLC um, Code of Practice for Means of Escape. Um, yes. And then there was, a, this <clears throat> there was the, the BS code of practice yes. for escape as well. So I looked at all of those. I came to the conclusion that what was installed at Grenfell at the point of construction was not compliant at that point. Yes. Um, uh, that was verified to me subsequently by Terry Ashton at Exover, who had come to the same conclusion as I had. Yes. Um, and then beyond that point, we then sought to look for the the... The, the submissions at the time of construction to see how that system was submitted to the equivalent of building control at the time. Yes. Um, but we found that RBKC had destroyed all records prior yes. to 1990. So we, we were unable to find anything else. It was a, somewhat yes. of a dead end, but on the face of it, it was not compliant at the time. Yes, that's very helpful. Thank you. And um, as part of your research into the guidance at that time, did you ever look at a guidance document called CP3 1971? Yeah, that's what I referred to as yes. BS CP3 rather yes. than the GLC CP3. Yes, because as Dr. Lane has explained in phase one of her work to the inquiry, there are certain key features of the tower which are indicative of the fact that it's probably that piece of guidance that was intended to be used in certain respects. Um, so, so you did note, note CP3 1971, yeah. Yeah, and the, my conclusion was, it, was that it was not compliant with yes, CP3. quite. And um, was one of the key reasons it wasn't compliant was because um, the aggregate area of the shafts on each side of the lobby is about 0.48 metres squared, whereas that guidance, for example, would have required it to be 1.5 metres squared. Is that the conclusion you came to? Correct. It was about a third of what would typically be required. Yes, thank you. That's very helpful. Now, just moving forward with the chronology and moving on to um, the Stage D report, you tell us at paragraph 34 of your witness statement, no need to go to it, that in November 2012, Max Forden's proposals were incorporated in the Stage, C, uh, stage D report. And we can see that report at MAX 50675, page 12.
MAX 50675. Great. And if we, that, so that's the stage D report. And if we look on, to, this is page 12, and this is where we find the smoke extract section. It's in the, the third column on the right under item U14, smoke extract. And first of all, what we see is an, a description of the existing system, yes? And we see a number of paragraphs. Yes. And then if we go over the page to page 13, we can see then in that left-hand column, top left-hand side of the page, new system. It says provide a new smoke extract system as shown, and there's a series of drawings referred to in a schematic, a smoke extract schematic. Extend the existing smoke extract system down two floors from the walkway level to the mezzanine level. So because you were creating new residential levels, one of the consequences was you had to extend the smoke control system downwards in the tower. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. Um, remove the existing fresh air supply fans and replace with new supply fans. Provide a new run and standby fan, etc., etc. All dampers are power open, power closed. So that's the new system. And again, um, was that effectively the, the push-pull system, mechanically pushing air in and mechanically extracting air out? Correct. Yes. Now, um, and is it right that this proposal was based on discussions with somebody called Fergus McGregor at PSB? Is that correct? In part, yes. Yes. You say in part... Why do you clarify that in, in that way? So, we were issued with the ACOM report just prior to, to submitting our Stage C report. Um, we weren't given much time, basically, so we, the Stage C report is, is almost, you know, is a, is a very high-level summary of the ACOM report, you know, the, the, the ACOM spec for, in, for inclusion. Between stage C and stage D, so RUBA stage C is concept stage, and stage D, stage D is design development, so we're developing the design between those two points. Um, there were a number of conversations. Primarily, Andrew was leading the smoke extract at this point. And I was aware of the conversations, but he was talking to PSB, but he was also um, speaking to XOVA at that point. Terry Ashton at over to ensure that as fire engineer they were also happy with our proposals. I see, yes. And were those telephone calls with Mr Ashton, do you recall? Or were they email exchanges? I would imagine both. Yeah. From memory, Terry was more likely to respond over the phone than perhaps on email. Yes, yes, thank you. And, and you say that um, PSB were partly involved. Um, can you help us, just from memory, do you remember roughly when were PSB first contacted by Max Fordham? Um, so I think I did obviously review the chronology um, <clears throat> of some of the evidence before coming in today. I, I believe it to be around November 2012. Yes. Um, and who made the decision to make contact with PSB? That would be Andrew McQuatt. Yes. And can you help us? What, why contact PSB? Do you know what, what the reason was why PSB were chosen to, for, for Max Fordham to, to contact? Um, I, I don't know. That was Andrew's decision. Yes, fair enough. And um, can you help us as to what was discussed with Mr McGregor in these early exchanges? Can you remember what advice uh, he gave? Um, again, some of this is from reviewing emails in, you know, shortly prior to, to this, but yes. and so I, I can't recall how many of those I was actually CC'd in on the time, but I yes. do know that Andrew and I did discuss it generally. Yes. Um, so it was basically going to PSB as a specialist contractor, specialist designer, um, to review the proposals that we had put together at that point. Yes. Um, which is not uncommon um, to, go to, a, to go to a designer before they're contracted. Yes. Um, just to get a high-level overview as to whether we're on the along the right lines, whether there's yes. anything else that we ought to be considering. Yes, that's helpful. And can you remember broadly what was being recommended by Fergus McGregor at this time, so prior to the Stage D report being prepared? It was a effectively a refurbishment of the a refurbishment and extension of the push-pull system. Yes. So, automating it as outlined within the ACOM spec. 
yes. which is what we took on as well. Um, and I, I, I believe there was probably some talk about improving upon the existing supply and extract rates. Yes. And, and do you know whether in those exchanges Mr McGregor ever expressed any doubts about whether a push-pull fully mechanised system would work at the tower, was viable? Do you remember there being ever any doubt expressed about that on PSB's behalf? I can only speak to the emails yes. um, and from conversation between myself and Andrew at the time. Yes. I don't believe I ever spoke to Fergus directly at that no. point. That's fine. Um, but I don't recall there being no. any, any negative conversations about it. It was, yes, this looks okay. Yes. And um, if we just go to your statement now, and I would like to show you this. If we go to paragraph 34 on page 12 of your statement and pick it up in uh, line four. You, you tell us, you say this, you say, it was never the intention to bring it up to the current standards, as there were hard constraints, including the size of the shafts, which were smaller in cross-sectional areas than those required in current standards. The shafts were builders' work shafts forming part of the structural core of the tower, which would be very difficult to make any larger without major structural works. Our intention was to make the system as good as we could within the constraints of the tower. And then you go on and talk about X over after that. Um, can you just help us, when you say as good as we could, it probably makes sense, but what exactly did you mean by that, as good as we could? So we previously touched on the non-worsening principle. Yes. Um, that is not something that was necessarily subscribed to by Max Fordham as a practice, and as, as certainly within the team working on this, we were very much trying to to do the best that we possibly could within within the constraints of the physical building itself, and obviously the budget as well does play into it with any with any construction project. Um, so we were basically, you know, accepting yes, there are limits, but we we want to improve it as much as we possibly can. Yes. So just to be clear, your objective was not simply to make it the same or a little bit better. It was actually to make it as good as it could be, but given the hard constraints you were facing. Yes. Correct. And was that, to your knowledge, and I appreciate you didn't have all the conversations, Mr McQuatt may have had some of them, was that communicated to PSB, that that was your objective, to try and make it as good as you could? I mean, I can't speak to the conversations that Andrew had, but I would I would be very surprised. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm at the risk of speculation. Yeah. I would be very surprised if if he hadn't have said. Yes. That. Because that's your whole philosophy uh, and the way you work at Max Fordham. Yes. I mean, yes, and I think that's reflected within the other works that we did in the tower as well. Yes, I understand. Now, at paragraph 35 of your statement, in the next page, page 13, you tell us, um, line, if we look at line four, I just want to pick up what you say there. You say, we were throughout this time trying to obtain information on the existing system so we could exist ex over in demonstrating the improvement of the system to building control. And then you refer to various emails. Um, so was your understanding that building control wanted to see some form of demonstration that the existing system was better by comparison with, with the old one? Yes. I mean, ultimately, building control have to approve whatever goes in there. Yes. So we have to be in a position to provide them with the necessary documentation that they need to see to be comfortable with that. Yes. And was the information that you obtained ever sufficient to be to be able to actually do that comparison, in your opinion? I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Well, we'll come to it. Maybe we'll come to it in due course. But it's right, isn't it, that it proved to be difficult to ascertain um, what the performance of the old system was? Correct. I mean, it, I can expand if you'd like as to why. Yes. Yeah. So... Our initial point would be to look for original design documentation. That wasn't available for Grenfell. Our next step would have been to test the system as was installed, but the system was not in a state 
to allow us to test that system. So beyond that, it becomes a calculation problem. So there are two routes for that. One of them would be it's, it's feasible that you could do CFD, I believe. It's not my area of expertise, but I know it has been mentioned by others. Yes. Um, or what we, what we did you know, eventually was we, did a, we calculated it ourselves based on the known information that we had on the yes. tower. Yes, yes. So some calculations were done, and we're going to come to the documents where we see this, of the flow rate based on the parameters you were working with and, and simple maths Correct. in terms of what you could work out the system might be able to perform if it was working correctly, yes? Correct. Yeah. Yes, thank you. And um, was that a common difficulty in your experience? Well, I guess maybe you didn't have that much experience at that time, but... Um, are you aware of whether that is a common difficulty in your industry when you're trying to look at non-worsening and compar comparisons? Is it often difficult to get reliable information about the system you're comparing with? From subsequent experience of working with refurbishment jobs, it can be very challenging getting accurate information about systems that have been designed. And ge generally, with the concept of accurate as-built documentation, patient, let, let alone design documentation, is a problem. Yes, thank you. Now, if we move forward now to the employer's requirements, um, so we're moving forward in time, but I, I have to take these steps in quite big leaps sometimes, otherwise we'd be here for too long. Um, and if we go to the employer's requirements now, this is PSB 50236. These are the employer's requirements for mechanical, electrical and plumbing services Correct. at Grenfell Tower. And um, if we turn to page 35 of this, so sorry, just to be clear, these are dated, I don't think the date's on this page, but they're dated the 19th of November 2013. Actually, you can see that. There's some tiny writing in the bottom corner of the document on each page, which gives that date. October 2013. Sorry, I said November. Actually, there's both dates. You've got 16th of October 2013, and then somebody's revised it with 19th of November 2013. Do you see that? Yes. It doesn't matter, but it just gives us an indication of when in the project this was prepared. So then if we go to page 35, here we get the employer's requirements for smoke control. And it says this in the first two paragraphs. It is not viable to adapt the existing system to comply with the current standards. Given the physical constraints of, exist of the existing building, the design approach has therefore been to retain the existing system and replace all of the existing components with new equivalent or better components. There are no design records for the existing system and it has not been possible to establish the fan duties. As there are no directly applicable standards which can be referred to, it is considered that it would be preferable to have a mechanical ventilation system and that it would be reasonable to design the system to provide an air change rate of 15 air changes per hour. And then it lists out the following new work that's to be carried out as a minimum to that system. And we've got various pieces of work and then a description at the bottom of that page about how the system would work with a fresh air supply and an extract. So again, um, this is what some people have referred to as the, the push-pull proposal, yes? Or the push-pull design is still in here, yes? Correct. Yes. Now, If we look at the final sentence um, of the second paragraph, I, I just read it out, we can see that um, the requirements were basing the new system on an air change rate of 15 changes per hour, yes? Yes. Now, is that, um, was that rate chosen because you were effectively seeking to impose some kind of criteria by which you might then be able to compare the performance of the new system against what you thought the existing system might be able to deliver? So, broadly, 
the design of the smoke vent system within Max Fordham was led by Andrew McQuatt from the beginning of the project up until stage D, yes. at which point the project was transferred down from the Edinburgh office where Andrew worked down to London. And then from stage D through to the end of production of the employee's requirements, the smoke extract portion of it uh, in terms of establishing performance criteria was predominantly led by Duncan Campbell, the senior yes. partner who I worked beneath on this project. I'm not sure where the 15 air changes per hour came from. It was yes. a number that I believe Duncan arrived at through conversation with Exova. Right. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Um, now, in his oral evidence to the inquiry, Mr. Marnie said that um, based on what he was told by Mr. McGregor and what Mr. McGregor had been told, um, and, and let's just look at this, actually, because it's easier to have it on the screen. If we go to day 155, page 30... And if we pick it up, um, <clears throat> no, that's not there. Sorry, that must be a wrong reference. Um, what he said is that Mr. McGregor was told how many floors there were, and he was asked what kind of system could be put forward. He was told what was already there, so he decided push-pull was the better solution because of the extended travel distances within the lobby area. So, so Mr. Marnie is saying that Mr. McGregor was aware of extended travel distances, and at that an early stage, he was satisfied that push pull would work. Now, what I want to ask you is: Do you remember there ever being any mention by PSB about there being extended travel distances in the lobbies at Grenfell Tower? Again, I can't speak to conversations that Andrew had, but it never came up in a <clears throat> in a conversation that I was involved in. Right. And all the meetings you attended subsequently, and we'll come to some of them later, do you ever remember it being mentioned that there were extended travel distances? So what I mean by that is travel distances on the lobby in excess of, sorry, I know you know, 7.5 metres, which is the, the maximum in an approved document B and in BS 9991. You don't remember there ever being any discussion about that in any meetings? Not that I recall. And he said... Um, he, he also said that Mr Marnie's understanding was that when they got to see the employer's requirements document, that there were additional restrictions that were spelt out in those employer's requirements, which PSB hadn't been aware of earlier, and which rendered it, the push-pull system less viable. Were you aware of PSB ever saying, well, now we've seen these employers' requirements and we see some of the additional restrictions, push-pull isn't going to work? Do you remember that being said? No, I don't. And we were very open and collaborative in our design approach with our, all contractors um, on the project. So had someone come to us and said, well, actually, you know, the wording of your ERs is preventing us doing something that we think would be beneficial, of course we would always review that. Right. So it's never said to you, well, there are such serious restrictions in these employers' requirements that um, we're going to have to change tack and do something different and we can't do push-pull? No. That was never said? Not to my recollection. No. Now... In paragraph 40 of your witness statement, page 14, I don't think we need to bring it up, you, you explain that whilst Duncan Campbell, that's the partner you were working under, continued liaising with Exova about what you call the building control issue, so that's showing to building control that the system's better, yes? Yes. Your task was to continue to seek information about the existing system, is that correct? That's yes. what you say? Yes. Yes. And you tell us that in January 2014, you contacted a company called RGE and you arranged a walkthrough of the existing system on the 22nd of January 2014. Do you remember that? I do. And you tell us that while on site, the RGE representative told you that as they did not believe that the system worked, 
they couldn't test it, and they also said it hadn't been maintained for a considerable period of time. Is that correct? That is correct. Did you get any indication about um, how long they thought a considerable period of time was that it hadn't been maintained for? Um, I didn't, but I, I believe I subsequently arrived at the conclusion that that must have been at least 2010, having based on documentation that they'd sent me subsequently, like after, after that walkthrough. Yes, OK. Now, I want to look a little bit more at, at some of Mr Marnie's evidence, and I want to start with um, paragraph 23 of his first witness statement. This is a PSB 401329 and at page five. Now, Mr. Marnie, we know, was Mr. McGregor's colleague within PSB. And I just want to read paragraph 23 to you. Um, he said, when I looked at these proposals, however, I could see that that could lead to problems with excessive pressure drop due to the high duct induct velocity within the existing builder's work shafts, which could result in inadequate flow being achieved through the shafts. And then he goes on and says, as a result, I developed an, in, an alternative proposal which still reused the existing ducts and shafts as per the employer's requirements, but which could achieve the functional objectives set out in the relevant guidance in place at the time. Now, just focusing... Um, well, I'll come to the detail of what he's saying there in a moment. But uh, do you remember Mr. Marnie ever explaining to you that there were problems with the push-pull design that Max Fordham had been suggesting up to that point? So my first interaction with, with Hugh was over the phone. Um, <clears throat> and he did put forward an alternative like he, he described a potential alternative design solution. Um, I'm not sure he said, I'm not sure he put it in the, he, I, I don't recall the full content of the conversation, so I don't know whether he said there are problems with your design or whether he simply put forward an alternative that he suggested was better. So yeah. as, as, you know, with him being an expert in smoke control systems, I was very open to hearing his alternative. Yes, I see. Um, and I appreciate that um, you can't remember him saying whether there were problems, but he's given some detail in this statement. He says that he thought it could lead to excessive pressure drop due to the high induct velocity within the existing builder's work shafts could result in inadequate flow being achieved. Did PSB ever spell that out to you, whether in the conversations you had with Mr Marnie on the phone or at a, a later stage? Did that particular problem ever get flagged to you about the push-pull system? I don't recall having that conversation. Right. But that isn't to say that I don't believe he's correct in his assertion there. No, I'll, I'll ask you that in a moment. Um, it, 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 just to be clear, in his oral evidence, Mr Marnie said that the problem was like a bit like the old quart, quart into a pint pot. You're trying to push too much air through a small hole, and this could create large pressure drops, which are difficult to balance out. Um, so you don't recall it being explained in those terms to you? I mean, I, I don't recall the full content of the conversation. So. Yes. Um, did you agree... Well, you kind of agreed it was a problem if you weren't told there was a problem, but um, had that point occurred to you while you were working up these proposals, that there could be this problem with excessive pressure drop? At the point in time when we've... When I first spoke to Hugh, we didn't actually have a design. Well, our design flow rate was substantially less than what was ultimately proposed by PSB. Yes. So at the design flow rate that we had been working to previously, pressure drop was not an issue. Um, so you know, I think that would be the first point where that could have been raised, because at that point, PSB, you know, perhaps we're, talking, we're thinking about a much higher flow rate than we were. I see. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes, that's helpful. So one, one p potential answer was a, a lower flow rate that might have dealt with that difficulty, in your opinion. A lower flow rate would... You wouldn't get an excessive pressure drop, but if 
if Hugh's point was that that wouldn't comply with the functional requirements of B1, then, yes. you know, obviously that would take precedence. Yes. And can you explain how you came to be dealing with Mr Marnie instead of Mr McGregor? Um, we know that Mr Marnie picks up the project and takes it forward, and then we know, and we'll come to it in a minute, he prepares an April 2014 proposal for this alternative solution. But what was your understanding about why you weren't dealing with Mr McGregor anymore? Um, I can't recall precisely, but I don't think I specifically requested to speak to Hugh. I think maybe Fergus was out of office. Right. But I, I don't recall precisely. OK, thank you. Now, Mr Marnie also said um, that the wall openings into the lobby could have had what he called velocity jets somewhere in the re region of 20 to 25 metres per second, which would push smoke into the stairwell during firefighting if there was a fire in a flat on the south side of the tower. So that's another problem that he described. And he said the problem, again, was the size of the ducts. Do you ever remember that problem being explained to you, either during telephone conversations or in any subsequent meetings? No. And um, if we look at paragraph 29 of his second statement, um, this is PSB 401373, page 6. He says, he says this, as, as well as the, this is 29, as well as the issues raised in paragraph 23 of my first statement, and we've just looked at that, I was also aware that the lobby layout at Grenfell Tower was not a typical corridor arrangement. The two shafts were located on either side of the lobby, but there were additional areas coming off the main lobby area which provided access to the flats in each corner of the tower. One shaft had a grill at low level, the south side, and the other had a grill at high level, the north side. The location of the door from the lobby to the stair was also an issue as it was not positioned at the end of a corridor. I recognise that the specific orientation of the lobby and the position of the shafts and door to the stair in Grenfell Tower meant that it would not be possible to adequately mitigate the risk that smoke would enter the stair using a push-pull system. Given the size of the lobby and the position of the shafts, there would also be dead spot areas in the lobby where there would be no airflow and therefore no mixing of air and smoke to create dilution. Now, again, um, there are a number of concerns here. Did, do you ever recall Mr Marnie explaining these concerns he had about the Max Ford and push-pull system? Again, I don't recall the exact content of the conversation, so I don't feel like I could give an accurate answer either way. I understand. Yeah. I think the language of, of, jet, of jets would have stuck in my head yes. at his previous point, but I, don't, I'm, I can't be sure with this one. I understand. Did, did you ever have a conversation with him about the unusual shape of the Grenfell Tower lobbies and the fact there were these dead ends and um, what that might mean in terms of the consequences for any smoke control system? I don't recall talking about the shape of the, the lobby specifically. I mean, we certainly spoke about the fact that it was not a typical arrangement. Yeah. And did you ever discuss the positioning of the vents? So as he points out there, on the south side, the south shaft vents are at, at, at floor level, at low level, whereas at the north side, they're higher up on the wall. Do you remember ever having a conversation about the effect of that on the smoke control system and its design? I mean, we certainly had a conversation about the position of the vents because it was <clears throat> integral to his understanding of the existing conditions of the building. Yes. Um, I don't recall it being mentioned in, in relation to the performance of a, of a subsequent design. Yes, I see. And, and you said before that on the phone he started mentioning an alternative solution, is that correct? That's correct. Um, and, and, and what was he, can you remember when he started explaining this to you, what did he say about this alternative solution? I, I can't recall exactly. I, I, believe it was words to the effect of this would be a better approach. Yes, I see. And, well, I'll come to it in a moment. Let's go then to PSB's design proposals put forward by Mr Marnie. J if we go to JSW 403474...
So this is these are the PSB smoke ventilation technical proposal for a stair depressurization systems for the Grenfell Tower project. And we can see that the author was Hugh Mahoney from the table prepared 22nd of April 2014. And if we go on to page two of this, it says under the introduction, it says, having identified possible problems with the proposed push-pull system leading to excessive pressure drop, due to the high induct velocity within the existing builder's work shaft, an alternative smoke control design solution is required. And then after discussions, this report provides an alternative approach to designing a lobby smoke control system. Now, pausing there, um, we can see, well, first of all, do you remember seeing this proposal? So this has been made, I've been made aware of this only very recently. Um, I didn't see this at the time. I don't yeah. believe I've been back through <clears throat> records. Yeah. Um, and I believe my first conversation with Hugh was actually post-dates this. Right. So he'd already prepared this when you spoke to him, you think? I mean, it, it, it appears to, based on the date, but I don't understand how, having seen some of the <laughs> content, you know, some of the, the, the communication at the, at the time. Yes. So I think what you're saying is you don't understand how this could have been prepared before you'd had that conversation with him about an alternative system, yes? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't want to speculate, but, but yeah, I don't... I, certainly, it doesn't, it doesn't fit with my understanding of the, cha of the chain of events and the chronology. I see. So is it possible that somebody else instructed him to prepare this and you were unaware of that at the time? Uh, I mean, I, I can't... <laughs> that would be speculation, yes, I think. I, I understand. <laughs> yeah. Now, um, and we can see um, in the third paragraph, it says the proposals have to be firmed up and submitted to building control authority for discussion and agreement. And then it goes on, the proposal is to design a depressurization system which will protect the stairwell by providing an airflow from the stairwell to the lobby when the stairwell lobby door is open. And it goes on, the velocity across the open stairwell door should be sufficient to meet the requirements for a Class B system within that British Standard 12101 Part 6. And it says it's proposed to use all four of the builder's work shafts as part of the smoke control system, which will result in a much reduced average induct velocity of five metres per second. Um, now, I appreciate what you've just said. You didn't actually get to see this at the time. Um, but um, can you just explain to us what your understanding was of what this alternative system would do compared with the Max Warden proposals? Based on the conversation I had with you over the phone? Yes. Sorry, I'll slow down talking a bit. I'm speeding up. Um, <clears throat> so I think after the phone call, I replied to Hugh via email with my understanding of the content of that phone call which was a, an email containing my, my basically repeating back to him my understanding of the description of the system that he had described to me, along with a, a marked up schematic. So I, I just used a pen and you know, overwrote our previous schematic in order to just, to, just to clarify, basically, that we were talking about the same thing. Yes. Um, which generally agrees with this, in that we would be extracting from all four shafts and the flow rate would be... Um, would be determined in order to meet uh, a door, uh, a, an air velocity across the door of two metres a second. So, yes. that, which broadly, broadly, um, broadly, that was your understanding. Yeah, which broadly, re which broadly reflects this. I mean, I don't think I'm not sure whether two metres a second is. You know, having never read, seen this until just recently, I can't recall whether the two metres per second is described in here. There's a there's a duct velocity mentioned yes. in here. We didn't discuss a duct velocity on the phone. No. Um, we just, we did, but we did discuss a, a velocity across a door. Yes. Were you familiar with the distinction between a fully mechanical extract system and a mechanical system using pressure differentials? So, my, as we progressed the design at Grenfell, it got called it a lot of different things that you know i think the the precision of language wasn't particularly great and my you know my understanding of that was because it was a bespoke solution from the beginning so it didn't neatly fit you know within any of the 
prescribed options within, for example, approved document B. And just pausing there, did Mr Marnie explain that to you, that it didn't fit neatly within any of the established systems, for example, as described in approved document B? I can't recall whether he put it to me like that, but I think it was a general understanding across the project team. Yes. That it was it was a, a bespoke system that was being progressed because of the because of the, the limitations of the of the building itself. Yes. And did you understand that that had certain advantages? Were you ever explained what the advantages of this system were? Versus the push pull. Yes. Um. I can't recall exactly what was described, but I, I certainly recall coming away from the initial conversation with Hugh thinking that was a neat solution. Yes. Yeah, and thinking, well, I'm glad we had this conversation. It seems like a better solution than what we have currently. Yes. And how enthusiastic was he about his solution when you spoke to him about it? He put it across as if this was, this was the way to do it. Yeah. Yes. And to what extent did you understand that PSB would be aiming to comply with some aspects of the code of practice that we see outlined there? Did, was it said to you that they would attempt to take some performance criteria from some of the recognised British standards? I can't recall precisely. Um, but I think having come away with a positive experience from the phone call, I'm sure he, he, he may have outlined exactly yeah. you know, the benefits of it yeah. for what reasons. Was it ever subsequently explained to you why those performance criteria were selected and not other performance criteria? Was that ever explained during the time you were involved? I recall there being conversations around yes, certainly as it led up to commissioning when we were talking about, when I was requesting information from PSP as to their commissioning sheets so that I could be sure that the system was operating correctly. There was talk at that point, certainly, around um, BS 12 101-6, <clears throat> and that was arrived at. Yeah, they, they'd clearly stated it within their technical submissions, and also I had read, I had read the relevant regulations and also asked internally within Max Fordham as to what this system ought to be commissioned, commissioned to, and the recommendation internally within Max Fordham was that BS 12 101-6 seemed to be the most relevant. So, you know, having made that dis decision amongst a number of different people, it seemed like the right way to go. Yes. So I was going to ask that question. I mean, you've explained you were quite inexperienced with these systems. Were there other people in Max Fordham that you did speak to about this alternative design once you understood it to check whether they thought it was a sensible proposal? Yeah, I mean, I do recall talk. It's very common within... You know, it was very, I can't speak for now, I haven't been, been there for five years, but it was certainly very common within the practice to to ask around for the more, ask the more experienced engineers. And there are certain specialists, you know, within the practice on certain areas, not necessarily smoke ventilation, but certainly on mechanical ventilation systems. Yes. Um, so yes, I would have spoken to. Yes. Others. Were there any specialists on smoke ventilation within Max Fordham that you could speak to? It wasn't a service that was offered. That's, yes. that's why we would work with a fire engineer and, you know, in this instance, a smoke ventilation specialist as well. Yes, thank you. Now, just looking at this proposal, we can see in the fourth paragraph, it says that the proposal is to design a depressurisation system which will protect the stairwell. Now, can you recall, to the extent you actually thought about it, um, did you understand PSB's design would be protecting the staircase alone or the staircase and the lobby? I understood that the staircase was was the most important, with it being a high-rise building. Yes. And I don't know whether it was spelled out to me or, or whether I had assumed that there would be a small measure of, of, of protection afforded to the lobby as well, just by dint that there is an extract rate there yes. after the smoke detector has been activated. Yes. And again, did you ever ask the question uh, whether the system provided protection in the means of escape phase and also the firefighting phase? Was that something that ever you ever thought about or that ever got discussed? It's a little hard to unpick this one just because obviously there's been so much talk about it subsequently. I certainly understood 
at, at a high level the reason for the different extract rates in the different conditions with the with the um, the door to the staircase open and with the door to the staircase closed and how important that was and yes. why why they were relevant. Yes. Um, I'm not sure whether I would have whether at, at the time I would have referred to them as the means of escape and the firefighting phases. Yes. In, in that language. Yes. And did you ever think beyond that one door and think about scenarios where flat doors were open or doors on other stair doors on other floors were open? Did you ever think about that and consider whether the design was intended to meet different scenarios as well as just the stair door being open? Um, certainly not all of those scenarios, personally not all those scenarios. Um, we were, as is often the case, reliant on other specialist in input, so XO as fire engineers and PSP. But having read, you know, having read around, around this at the time, the building regulations, the guidance documents, I was certainly aware of the fact that the fire brigade would likely connect their hose on the floor below, and then you know, yeah. therefore be two doors open. Yes. Um, my understanding of the system was such that the you know, the extract, they, they would still be able to maintain two metres per second across the door, was my understanding yes. within that condition. You mentioned Exova just then. Do you ever remember discussing this alternative proposal with Exova? And if so, what was their response? So the revision after this one, which is the one that I received, um, was I, I received that. I immediately sent it on to Terry Aston at Exova. <coughs> For review, and I think stating in there, words to the effect of this is you know, somewhat outside of our area of expertise. Can you review this for me and let me know if this is acceptable for you? And did you ever get a response back? I've been back through, and I don't, I don't recall getting one. No, um, it may have been a phone call, but yes. I, I, I'm usually quite good at yeah. responding to phone calls over email. Yes. I think I've got coming up in my notes, I can show you that email, in fact, where you send that request to Exova. But I just wanted to check at this stage whether you remember ever getting a response from Exova about the alternative design proposal. I don't recall getting one. And you don't remember chasing Exova for that? Um, I don't know. I, I can't recall. If, there's, if, there's, if there isn't an email chasing, then yeah. I obviously didn't do it over email. So. Yeah. Um, Mr. Marnie has described his proposal in this way. He said it was an alternative design solution that met the spirit of the requirements because we couldn't meet the requirements. Again, just to be clear, was that your understanding from the outset? Yeah, my understanding was it was a bespoke system. There were very specific constraints within the tower and that we were doing the best that we could within those constraints. Yes. Now, just look at an e email chain now. So this is PSB 6025, page 2. There's an email um, at 11 a.m. on the 2nd of May. Sorry, PSB 6025, page 2. Yes, so here is an email from you to Mr. McGregor of PSB, copying in Mr. Marnie of PSB on the 2nd of May 2014. And in your email you say, Morning Fergus, I understand you're the person to speak to regarding residential smoke extract system in Hugh's absence. And then you say, spoke to Hugh yesterday about a refurbishment job in London, which I believe a colleague of mine in our Edinburgh office has previously previously discussed with Jim Shields. We're looking to bring the existing non-compliant push-pull system up to scratch, and after speaking with Hugh, it seems a pressure differential system would be the way to go. So does that help us in terms of timing when that conversation was that Mr Marnie first mentioned his, or you first spoke to him, and he mentioned this alternative design? Yes. Now, in his oral evidence to the inquiry, Mr Marnie said that in that conversation, he was told what the employer's requirements were, the size of the shafts and the wall openings, etc., 
and the restrictions which that would place on any proposals. And it was in that conversation that he mentioned that push-pull wouldn't work with that arrangement. Now, I, I, I know I'm keep coming around this from different angles, but do you recall um, him saying that during that conversation that you had in May 14? So again, I don't recall the exact content of the conversation. All I recall is coming away from it thinking that that Hugh's solution seemed a neater solution than than ours. So yeah. he may have used words to that effect. I'm not. I'm unsure. He also said in his oral evidence this week that at some point after the first of May, 2014 telephone call, you had a second conversation in which he told you that it was absolutely impossible to install a compliant system i.e. a system which, which complied with any of the current codes of practice, regulations or guidance, given the restrictions in the employer's requirements. Do you recall a second conversation where he said that to you? I mean, I certainly don't recall any conversation where it was the employer's requirements that were causing a restriction. You know, we certainly had conversations about the physical limitations of the building itself, perhaps. Yes. Am I right in understanding it was part of the employer's requirements to retain and reuse the existing builder's work shafts? Yes. I think from very early conversation with Exova and structural engineers and architects, that was deemed the only yeah. viable solution. I, I asked the question because I sensed from his evidence that that was the key restriction, all right, within the employer's requirements that really affected uh, the identification of any solution. Yeah, I mean, I could see how we could, how we could take that view. Mm. Um, and it was you know, the fundamental restriction, if you like. Yeah. All right, thank you. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, no, thank you. Um, Mr Marnie also said in his oral evidence that, that Max Fordham and partners decided that they could not go with a system that didn't comply with anything that they could refer to. So they went forward on a, what he called, went forward on a betterment. Now, first of all, was that phrase ever used during the time of the project, that you were going forward on a betterment? So I don't recall the phrase being used. Um, and I think it, <clears throat> it might be helpful just to separate two issues somewhat here. Yes. So there's the design of the smoke control system where we were very much seeking to get the best performance that we could within the restrictions and as close as possible to current standards but with with recognition that that we couldn't meet you know we're unlikely to meet current standards if it was a new build because of the physical restrictions so that's one yes. element and then the other element was building control approval yes so you know, from a building control perspective, we just needed to give them the information that they needed to see in order to approve a system. So I suppose in hindsight, there, there may have been two ways of doing that. One would be a fully fire engineered solution <clears throat> to show that, approve, that, it, that it met all of the, the requirements within approved document B, yes. be, it, be it not the prescribed route. Yes. Um, and the other one being to show that it was an improvement over what was already there. Yes. But I think it's important to separate the two issues because it's not they're not one and the same. The design wasn't progressed on the basis that all we had to do was squeak it, it past building control. Yes. And, and overall, that's the impression we got from some of Mr Marnie's evidence on Monday, was that that was the design intent, was just show it's better than the old one and, and that's satisfactory. Are you saying that that's certainly not your recollection of how the design was proceeding? No. I mean, that might have been viewed as the strategy to get it to pass building control, if you like. Yeah. Um, as being the path of least resistance to, to get building control approval. Yeah. But they were two very much separate issues. Yeah. Uh, certainly in my mind throughout the design process for the tower. Yes. Thank you. Um, and if we just have a look uh, again at the transcript, um, go back to, if we go to day 155, page 65, Mr. Marnie's evidence. Uh, 
And looking from um, line two, so he said, no, it wasn't necessary. As I said before, because the project didn't go ahead based on the design, it went forward on the betterment on the ventilation rate. And I say, question, so why was it not necessary to set out the functional requirements? And then he says, because the design was not accepted. And then question, and when you say because the design was not accepted, which design are you saying was not accepted? He says, answer, the PSB design. We put forward a design proposal to fulfil those functions. Max Fordham and partners decided that they couldn't go with a system that didn't comply with anything that they could refer to, so they went forward on a betterment They used the ventilation rate that we gave them to prove the betterment. So it wasn't a design that went forward, it was a betterment that went forward. And then question, I see, when was that agreed with Max Fordham? Answer, that wasn't. When you say agreed with Max Fordham, Max Fordham agreed it with building control. Question, I see, and what you were just told, that's what's happened? Yes. When we tendered the job, a document was placed before us which said that that was the case, and that document was adopted and placed in our technical submission. Now, we'll come on in a moment to the document that, uh, the Max Fordham document that um, Mr. Marnie was referring to, which which he was relying on as saying that that the objective was simply to beat the rate of the old system. Um, But I just wanted to put that to you and ask you whether that was consistent with your understanding of how the project progressed. Now, I think your answer is going to be the same as the one you just gave, where you, you're separating out two things. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, that is, that's correct. Um, <clears throat> up until the point where the ERs were produced, then what we are saying within the ERs is that we're improving the system by automating it, and by increasing the extract rate over what was currently there as an improvement to the existing. And then subsequent to that, we've had discussions with PSP where Hugh has proposed what he, what he views as an expert, as a, an improvement over what we had in our ERs. And we've basically accepted that because it appeared to be a better solution. So, and yes, there was also separately some discussion with building control over what they needed to see in order to 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 be satisfied and to, to pass it. But I wasn't directly involved in all of those com- in all of those conversations and meetings with building control. I was often requested to produce something that could be given to building control. I see. Does that make sense? That does make sense. Can, can I just ask, what, what, would it be right to understand that as far as building control are concerned? There were two possibilities. One is that you show compliance with the existing uh, guidance. And the other is, because it's a refurbishment, you satisfy them that it's no worse than it was. Yes. And in one sense, betterment could cover both of those approaches. I, I mean, I'm unfamiliar with Hugh's term of betterment. No, I, 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 to yeah, I, I read it as the second of those approaches which is to show that it's an improvement over what was already there. I think betterment is a slightly strange term to use for compliant with current regulations. Well, I I understood him to have in mind something better than the existing system, though not as good as current, full current compliance with current regulations. Yeah. And from the point of view of building control, that would do, would it not? It would. It would. Yeah. It would be the. It would be an improvement over what was there. So, from a building regulations perspective, it would follow the no worsening principle. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Sir. Yes. Thank you. Um, I just finish one further question on this topic of what you discussed with Mr. Marnie, and then we're going to come on to look at some different documents. So perhaps we can break then. Uh, Mr. Marnie also referred to having a conversation with Max Fordham about CFD modelling of the proposed system at Grenfell. Do you recall that ever being discussed? I don't recall it in connection with PSB. I do recall there was a conversation about CFD between ourselves, the TMO and Exova at one point. Um, in order to satisfy building control, because I think building control, I can't recall exactly, they may or may not have raised it as one one particular route in order to satisfy them. Um, I don't recall talking about it with PSP. 
Right, thank you. What Mr Marnie said was, he said, this was discussed with Max Fordham and partners. There was insufficient time to carry out modelling, so modelling was not considered, and that was also a requirement of why the decision to go down the pet betterment route. There wasn't time to get any approval for a non-standard system. Now, first of all, do, do you remember a discussion between Max Fordham, you or anyone else at Max Fordham and Mr Marnie, in which it was agreed that there was insufficient time to carry out CFD modelling? I mean, I don't... It was a long time ago now, so I don't... I, I'm not entirely sure. One thing that did just occur to me then is that it, uh, the, initial, the initial point of the conversation with... Well, it was supposed to be Fergus initially, but it was it turned out to be Hugh, was in order to to get some more information from them for to include within a a report that, or an analysis that I was preparing to put in front of for the TMO to put in front of building control effectively to show our calculated flow rate for the existing system versus what our proposed system would have. So the original purpose of the call was to speak to PSP to understand what their proposed supply and extract rate, because at that point it was on the push-pull system. Yes. Now, I may potentially, I, CFD could have been floated within there. Yes. I can't recall exactly. Um, but then subsequent to that, there was a, a, after the email exchange that we spoke about, where I clarified with a, um, a marked-up schematic, there was another phone call with Fergus at PSP, because I was hoping to talk to Hugh again, but I got Fergus this time. Um, and Fergus was very much in favour of the push-pull system. So at that point, because I had to get this, you know, maybe there's an understanding in, in timing in that I was trying to prepare this analysis by probably the end of the week, which is when I've been told to do it by. Fergus was very much in favour of the push-pull system, saying he didn't think differential would be feasible. Um, so gave me some gave me some flow rates for a push-pull system, which subsequently made its way into my analysis, which then went to the TMO. Whether or not it went to building control, I've no idea, but it went to the TMO. Yes. So I don't know if that helps to have a little bit of context behind that. Yes. And can you remember Fergus McGregor ever explaining to you why he didn't think the differential would be feasible? Not precisely, but I think complexity, I think. I think he thought it was overkill, you know, in a way. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I think that's a good moment. Is that a good for point? Yes, yes it is. all right. Uh, well, we do. We want to have a break during the afternoon session, uh, and uh, we're going to take it now, Mr. Crossmith. So, <clears throat> we'll uh, come back, please, at twenty-five to four. Okay. And uh, while you're out of the room, please don't talk to anyone about your evidence or anything relating to it again. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. We'd like to go to the usher, please. Good. 25 to 4, please. Thank you.
Would you ask Mr. Cross Smith to come back in, please? All right, Mr. Cross Smith. Yeah. When you're ready, Ms. Grange, thank you. Yes, thank you. Yes, before we broke, um, you were explaining this distinction that you think is important between perhaps what Max Fordham were trying to do with the system, but then and then strictly what non-worsening might mean and what building control wanted to see in terms of non-worsening. Can you just help us? Uh, what was Max Fordham's baseline for the existing system? Was it looking at what the existing system could do if it was working? Was that the baseline? Sorry, are you going to go on and offer another option? Or? I will in a minute, but let, okay. let me just <clears throat> find out if it was that option. So were you asking yourself the question for non-worsening purposes, what is the existing system capable of doing, assuming it's operational? Is Correct. that the question you're answering? Correct. But to what extent did it factor into your thinking that, well, that's one question, but actually we know that the existing system was non-compliant with the standards when it was built. So was there any part of your thinking that when you look at non-worsening, you should look at what a compliant system ought to have been at the time? Mm. No, is the short answer. Yes. Okay. No, that's helpful. Thank you. Now, at paragraph 47 of your statement, page 16, you say that um, PSB, and I think you've referred to this, gave you a target of five metres cubed per second for the system that they were designing. Is that correct? That is correct. And you say that you'd asked them where that figure came from, and they said it was the number that they always used. So you adopted that as the target for the proposed system. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes. Um, it was also, I think, on the same email as well as saying it was a number they also used, I think they mentioned that it was proven by CFD, <coughs> or right. a number of CFD. Yes. Policies. Now, let's go to the document you were referring to earlier, which I think you say is the document that you were preparing to assist building control in its analysis. This is MAX 402335. This is um, revision B, dated the 13th of May 2014, of something called the smoke ventilation analysis. And if we look on to page two, we can see that what this document does in summary is it says this report has been prepared in order to compare the design performance of the existing smoke extract ventilation system in Grenfell Tower with the design performance of the new system proposed as part of the refurbishment works. And then you go on part of the existing system are now approximately 40 years old, etc. And then below that in bold, it says it's been found that the proposed upgrade to the system should result in a considerable performance increase. Flow rate of existing system, 1.1 to 1.2 metres cubed per second. Flow rate of proposed system, 5 metres cubed per second. Yes? Yes. Now, can you just explain to us, the, the, in your own words, the background to how this document came to be created? The reason for the document? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> so we've been having some conversation with building control from much earlier on in the project. We knew that the smoke mental, the smoke control system, by nature of it being, you know, very limited in what we could do with it, it would we would have to be to make sure building control were kept up to date with our design as it progressed to make sure that they were happy with it effectively. Um, so we'd been having a series of conversations with them. We, so between, I think I said before, up to stage C, we were using um, the ACOM report, the ACOM spec. Um, between stages C and D, we circulated the ACOM spec to both Exova and PSP to get their view on whether that was a suitable proposal. Um, we may not have sent, sorry, we may not have sent PSP the ACOM spec, but we, we sent them our design. And then from stage D until the ERs were produced, we were then, Duncan was dealing with X over, trying to get X over to give us a proposed supply rate, effectively, or extract rate, if you like, supply and extract rate for the building. And we were struggling, I think, I recall, to get a number out of them for that. 
So I think the ER has progressed on using the 15 air changes per hour, yeah. uh, which is, uh, and again, I don't recall where that number came from. I think Duncan, it was Duncan's number and it may or may not have come from conversation with Xova. And then beyond, and then building control, I think, was sent either the employer's requirements that had the 15 air changes per hour stated in it, or there was a separate document prior to this one that I think Duncan produced, which was called Smoke Control Proposal, um, which either had the 15 air changes per hour or it had no supply or extract. You know, there just wasn't a rate attributed to it. It was described as mechanical, but no rate. Um, so building control subsequently came back and said, we don't think that you are adequately proving that, the, that your proposal is an improvement. Yes. Um, and they laid out what they would like to see in order to satisfy them that it was an improvement. So the outcome of that was, well, we could go away, we could do either what we termed hand calculation, it's, you know, it's an Excel spreadsheet effectively, and a design, um, or CFD. Yeah. Um, and it was decided that the hand calculation route would be the way that we would go, and that's where this document comes from. Yes. And did you draft this document? Yes. Yes. Um, and if we look on page um, seven, we can see a little bit more about the comparison that was being done. Here we can see it says the new fans will be sized to provide the minimum of five metres cubed square per second flow rate at the furthest point from the fans. This is in line with the current best practice for balanced pull push push pull sorry type smoke ventilation systems with the figure arising from a 3.5 meters cubed per second flow rate through an open door to prevent smoke ingress from the lobby to the escape stair during the escape plus an additional 1.5 meters cubed per second allowance for leakage from the existing online builders work shafts and remaining dampers and then you set out in the table those figures and below it says from the table above it can clearly be seen that the performance of the smoke ventilation system in Grenfell Tower will be considerably improved as part of the refurbishment works. In addition, the new system will also be significantly more reliable and easier to maintain than the current system. So, um, so this document, just to be clear, was still based on the push-pull type smoke control system. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. So I think just before the break, I explained, I spoke to Hugh. <clears throat> he proposed a pressure differential he was an out-of-office suspect to Fergus. Fergus reverted to push-pull and recommended that one and gave me the numbers. And those are the numbers that I've used here, so it's still push-pull at this point. Yes, because Mr Marnie said on Monday that it was an error to have push-pull in this document, but what you're now saying is that you'd got that figure of five metres per cube per second from Mr McGregor at PSB. Correct. And, and that's why that appears in here, is that correct? Correct. Yes. Was there ever any similar analysis done for the PSB alternative proposal? By us? Yes. No. Did you ever see one from PSB? No, but it was fundamentally different at that point. And also the five metre cube per second remained. So you, on face value, you could say, well, you could compare the two values and already there's a much higher extract rate than was previously in the building. Yes, I see. Now, if we just look at an email from you um, at now, MAX405634. This is an email dated the 19th of October 2015. So it's from you to Artelia, copying in a number of others. And uh, picking it up in the third paragraph, you say, subsequent to the tender, May 14, we were instructed to produce a report for building control by the TMO. This was to show the fire brigade that work was progressing on the system in order to respond to an enforcement notice. We again went to PSB for advice, and at this point they suggested that their recommendation would be to increase the airflow in order to bring it closer to current regulations. They also advised that building control would be more likely to accept the proposal if a larger flow rate was specified, hence the five metres cubed per second figure. Now, those discussions that you're talking about there with PSB, were they with Mr McGregor or Mr Marnie? Um, just give me a moment to read this. Sorry. <clears throat>
Yes, this is, yeah, it's the same conversations. Yes, that you're referring to. Yes. Yes. And in, in this email, you then refer to a change of strategy in the next paragraph. You say, further design development by JS Wright with PSB eventually resulted in a technical submittal whereby the design system retained the five metres cubed per second figure but changed strategy from supply and extract system to an extract-only type system based on further advice from PSB. This is what was presented to building control for approval and was subsequently accepted. Yes. Sorry, what, I, I missed the question within that. <laughs> no, I, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to kind of... Recall that that's consistent, isn't it? But that actually, what you've just been telling us yes. in terms of what subsequently happened. Um, can you recall whether the document that you prepared, that ventilation analysis, do you know? I think you may have touched on this earlier whether it was ever actually sent to building control? Um, I don't know. I sent it directly. <clears throat> there was two revisions of it. Revision A went to the TMO. And then revision B uh, went to the TMO and potentially yes. X over. Yes. Um, We've checked, and revision A was still based on the push-pull system, as was revision B, and there are some minor amendments to the text, but it's predominantly the yeah. same document. Is that your recollection? Yeah. Yes. Now, JS Wright's appointment now, if we go to paragraph 48 of your statement on page 16... Here you're describing a change in Max Fordham's role. Um, so you say, at the kickoff meeting with Ryden and J.S. Wright in August 2014, we sought an update on the status of the smoke ventilation system design proposals and building control approval, and were informed subsequently by Claire Williams from the TMO that it was being left for Ryden to deal with in their application to building control. The design of the smoke ventilation system was now in the hands of J.S. Wright, who were taking the lead with building control, as confirmed by J.S. Wright's email to building control of the 17th of October 2014. Our involvement was reduced to answering queries on the employer's requirements, such as our email to Ryden of the 23rd of October 2014, confirming that a dial-up connection to a remote monitoring service or the London Fire Brigade from the central control panel was required. And in relation to queries raised by J.S. Wright about the schedules in the employer's requirements which needed updating following the airflow rate increase proposed in the smoke ventilation analysis prepared in May 2014. At this stage, the design of the smoke ventilation system was still an upgrade of the existing system and not the PSB design that was eventually installed. So you're explaining that once uh, Ryden are appointed and J.S. Wright are appointed as Ryden's m and &E subcontractor, your role changed, is that correct? That's correct. And um, you've explained that, is this right, your role was then limited to responding to queries about the employer's requirements that you'd written? Correct. We were uh, retained directly <clears throat> by the TMO in an advisory role to ensure that um, that the the contractors didn't deviate too much from our employers' requirements from a uh, satisfactory performance perspective. Yes, I see. So you're advising the TM TMO to ensure that whatever system's put in still effectively meets your employer's requirements. Yeah, yes. correct, across all parts of the project. Yeah. And does that mean that um, you didn't consider the alternative design in detail, but just looked at the general principles behind it and whether they were consistent with your employer's requirements? I mean, I, I believe I did look at the this particular design in detail because it was somewhat critical to the building yes. um, and I think I think we touched on it earlier that on receiving the technical submission I reviewed it and then forwarded it to Xover with more expertise than me in order to go through it as it stood relative to the, <coughs> the yes. fire strategy. Yes. Uh, would you accept that Max Fordham was also involved with some ongoing discussions with building control thereafter including attending a meeting at which building control were present? Uh, we attended the meeting, but very much in a in a 
reduced capacity. We, I sat and listened in effectively. <clears throat> the I meeting see. was driven entirely by PSB and JS Wright. I see. Yes, I'm coming to that meeting in a moment. Um, but also you did witness some of the... Um, a demonstration of the system, didn't you? Yeah, we were within our contracts. We were down to witness certain major elements of plant or equipment, rather. Yes. Now let's go to that meeting. Um, if we go um, to an email to remind you, it, it's at max four zero four six six five. This is an email from you to Claire Williams at the TMO, copying in your superior, Duncan Campbell. And, you, and it's on the 24th of November, 2014. So this is sometime after Ryden's appointment. And you say, evening, Claire. We had a meeting this morning with Building Control regarding the proposed smoke extract system with Ryden, JS Wright, Studio E, and the smoke extract system supplier, PSB. JS Wright have developed a slightly updated proposal with PSB, which would eliminate the need for the fresh air inlet, which was previously at the top of the glazed foyer. It would instead take the make-up air from a vent at the head of the stair core. We have yet to receive a technical submittal for this, but in principle it appears to be a neat solution, which also satisfies building control. And then if we just look down, and then you go on to... Um, talk about other topics. Now, you say at the end of that paragraph that, in principle, um, building control accepted the proposed design. Well, you say that they, it satisfied building control, yes? Yes. Was that your understanding of, of what happened at the meeting when you were present yeah, at it? My, <clears throat> my understanding was that building control gave a tacit approval that if this was progressed, then it would be something that they would be comfortable with. Yes. And can you remember from the meeting, how much detail did PSB and JS Wright go into about the alternative design, the mechanical extract using depressurisation principles? Um, I believe they went into some detail. Yes. Yeah. And um, did you get the impression that the building control officer, Mr Hansen, fully understood the system that they were proposing at that meeting? Yes, it was quite a detailed conversation. Yes. Were any concerns voiced at that meeting by anyone, as far as you can remember, about that alternative system? No, I think it was generally well received. Did you make any comments on behalf of Max Warden? I, I, I can't recall, is the short answer. But I, again, I came away from the meeting thinking it had been a successful meeting. Yes. And can we look now at the email you just referred to, where you seek some some more advice from Mr Ashton. This is at MAX 404795. This is um, an email dated the 6th of January 2015 from you to, to Mr Ashton. And we can see you've attached a number of um, documents, nine attachments in total. And then if we look down at the text of your email you say afternoon terry can you look over and provide comment on the smoke extract proposal put forward by psb on behalf of js wright it looks acceptable and i believe the principle of it has been verbally accepted by building control but it may be wise to get your view as it falls slightly outside our area of expertise it's fundamentally different to what we specified in that it's now a pressure differential system rather than simple smoke clearance Details can be found below. If you have any questions, then please give me a call. Now, you've already explained that you you didn't get a response to this email from Exova. Is that correct? I don't recall getting a response. <clears throat> Did you advise your client, um, the TMO, that you'd tried to seek some advice from Exova on this question and uh, hadn't managed to receive any advice in return? Um, I don't recall. I certainly had a conversation with my superior, Duncan Campbell, about this. <clears throat> we were having quite a bit of difficulty with getting information out of Exova. It had been a common thing throughout the project. Um, I don't recall how it was resolved in this case. It may have been that Duncan had spoken to Terry. Sorry, I'm slightly losing my voice. That's OK. Do you want to have some water? It's, all right. it's not particularly. Yeah. <laughs> and you can't recall 
Mr Campbell raising it with the TMO that you had sought some advice on this specialist proposal put forward by PSB from Exova, but you hadn't had a response? Um, I, I don't recall. Now, in paragraphs 50, 50 and 51 of your statement, you, you explain that after J.S. Wright sent you the PSB technical submission on the 12th of January 2015, you asked for a schematic to make sure J.S. Wright and PSB had properly considered the complexities of Grenfell Tower, and this was provided in the next round of drawings from J.S. Wright on the 30th of January 2015. Do you remember that? I do. And what do you mean by um, to make sure that they had properly considered the complexities of the tower? Can you be more specific about that? So just in our <clears throat> relationship with the TMO at that point as an advisor, <clears throat> I wanted to ensure that PSB, obviously Max Fordham as a, as a company had been involved in this project far longer than JS Wright had. And yes, we'd had conversations with PSB <clears throat> and we'd shared design documentation with them. But I wanted to be satisfied that JS Wright and PSB fully understood the building you know, because it was, you know, as we've established, a non-standard system, and it was quite, there was some complexity to it that that had all been adequately taken care of in my capacity, in my capacity as an advisor to the client. Yeah, and, and in terms of the information that came back and the quality of it, were you satisfied that JS Wright and PSB had sufficiently understood the complexities of Grenfell Tower in putting together their proposal? Yes. And then if we go to RBK 3033900. No, I don't think that's... Um, actually, yes, page two of that, sorry. Let's go to page two of that. Yes, this is um, a memo from Paul Hansen to John Hoban, dated the 24th of June 2015. And this is where Mr Hansen, who was the, the specialist dealing with means of escape, says to Mr Hoban that the proposals set out in PSB's te uh, technical submission were satisfactory. You can see that under the, the bold lines, before, just before the numbered paragraphs. And he says at the bottom, generally the components of the system should conform to the guidance on smoke control to common escape routes, revision 1, June 2012. Now that's the SCA guidance. Um, did building control ever mention the SCA guidance to you um, during any of your meetings with them? I don't recall it being referenced to me personally. And um, you tell us in your statement... This is paragraph 52, but we'll keep this document up. You say, building control was aware from the various discussions that the whole system could not be compliant with the current guidance on these systems included within ADB due to the size of the shafts. I therefore took his comment at point three, so that's the comment, the comment about components, to mean that whilst the system as a whole could not follow the current guidance, the components of the system should still comply with the requirements within the stated list of regulations, and that's why the phrase components is used at point three. Now, um, did you, I think it follows, did you ever check whether the proposal that was being put forward was more generally compliant with that guidance, not just in terms of the components, but in terms of other aspects of the guidance that was being put forward? No, <clears throat> that's the short answer. I mean, I, my belief at this point in the project that everyone was fully aware of, of the complexities and what we were and weren't seeking to, to meet, um, so I think when I read this, I, you know, it was with the understanding that they were fully under, they were fully aware of where we were in the design process, what wasn't, and how we were how we were approaching it, um, and that's why I came to the conclusion in my witness statement that they were talking specifically about the components, and by that I mean the dampers and the fans. And, yes. You know, yes, I understand. Um, 
Now, in terms of the final design and how it, how it sat, we know, and I'll take you to the document in a moment, that that was set out in PSB's Technical Submission Revision 6. Um, do you remember seeing that final Revision 6 of the Technical Submission? Um, I mean, I remember seeing quite a few revisions and commenting back and forth. <coughs> From memory, I can't remember which one was the last I one I saw. Okay. Did anyone ever say at any time that the system was designed to reflect something called the Colt shaft system? Was that ever discussed? Not to my recollection. Now, earlier this week, Mr Marnie said in his evidence that the decision to design the new system so that the south shaft extracted smoke downwards and out at lower levels. He said it became incorporated by the instruction of others. Um, and he said that the, final, that the final design, which was to extract down at south level and up at north level, would still work, but it wasn't as clean a design as I'd proposed. Now, can you remember whether there was ever an instruction from Max Fordham to change the design in that way so that the south shaft extracted downwards? I, I don't. I mean, it wasn't an instruction that I made, certainly, but I don't recall us instructing that. I remember it as being a development of the design. Yes. At some point, the design changed. Yes. And I could see benefits to that in some ways, in that you know, there was some complexity with joining those, those shafts within the plant room at the top. Yes. But I'm, I, I, don't, I certainly don't recall it coming from us to say, hey, why don't we do this instead? Yes. So you do clearly recall that originally it, they were going to extract both upwards, join the two shafts together, extract upwards, and then there was a change to extracting downwards on the south shaft. Yeah, in so much as I remember the, the marked-up schematic that I sent back to Hugh after our, telephone, after our initial telephone call, I marked that up to join the two shafts together yeah. at the top, which I think must have reflected the conversation we'd had. Um, and I, I can't remember exactly at what point we moved away from that and for what reason, but I don't remember it being directed by us. Because we were not actually involved in the design at this point. We were very much in an advisory <coughs> capacity. Yes. If we could just look at Mr Marnie's uh, witness statement on this point, if we go to PSB 401329 and look at page 11. Uh, at little three, Mr Marnie is um, explaining, in this part of his statement, he's explaining a number of changes that happened to the design during the course of those technical submission revisions. Um, and he says here that, um, as well as the configuration of the extended smoke shafts, another detail which was finalised after the initial design work recorded in revision one was the specification and location of the fan sets used in the system. Initially, it was envisaged that the north and south smoke shafts would be connected at the top of the building and they would feed to a single smoke extract fan located at roof level. Now, pausing there, was that your understanding of his original design, that there'd be a single fan extracting at roof le level? Well, there would be two because there'd be a backup fan as well, but it would be a single fan set. Yes. Um, but yeah, I believe that was what... I mean, only in so much as was was discussed over the phone in one phone call and then we're there, you know... A pen markup. Yes, I then scanned I and presented back to him. I understand. Thank you. And then he goes on and he says, however, given that an environmental fan needed to be installed at low level, and given the space limitations at Grenfell Tower, the design was changed to incorporate one smoke extract fan set in the rooftop plant room, which was used to extract via the north shafts in both environmental and smoke control mode, another smoke extract fan set at walkway level, which was used to extract via the south shafts in smoke control mode, and an environmental supply fan at walkway level, which was used to supply makeup air via the south shafts in environmental mode. And he explains that this arrangement is reflected in revision five of the technical submission onwards. And he says he also confirmed in an email exchange that the ductwork housing the smoke extract fan at walkway level needed to be fire rated. Now, um, if we could just go to his oral evidence on this point, and at if we can go to day 155 and look at page 75. And if we pick it up in line 21, 
He says, this is a later design. Which design are we talking about? Originally, everything was extracted from the top of the building. The two shafts were joined together in the rooftop plant room with one extract fan set. And then, yes. And if we go over the page, he says, this is a much later development. And then question, I see. So I think this is the design as it was finally intended to be. Is that correct? That's correct, but it's not our design. And then I say, when you say it's not your design, why do you say that? Our design was to connect two shafts together, the south and north side in the rooftop plant room with a single fan set. The design evolved through the course of the contract by other parties. I see. So are you saying it wasn't part of your design intent for the smoke to be extracted downwards? As we can see on the bottom left-hand side of that drawing, initially, no. Question, but did it become part of your design, that it was extracting downwards? We can see the flow path going through the ductwork at the lower levels and then out to the outside. And then it answer, it became incorporated at the instruction of others. It sounds from what you're saying like you were not happy with that <coughs> instruction by others. Is that the case? Well, not, I'm not happy with it. My preference would have been the original design. It was a much cleaner, simpler design than what then evolved during the course of the construction work on site. Now, can you help us? Were you ever party to any meetings or discussions with Mr. Marnie where this re revision to the design was discussed? This particular revision? Um, my last interaction with PSB, I believe, was at the meeting with Building Control. <clears throat> From that point onwards, all communication related to PSB came through JS Wright, because they were PSB were JS Wright's subcontractor. Yes. Um, and I believe I only interacted via re receipt of text submittals and commenting on them. Yes. Were you ever, did you ever uh, pick up that PSB were saying that the second design either wasn't theirs or that they were not happy with it. No. That was never said. And, and just to be absolutely clear, uh, who was the specialist designer of the system, so far as you were concerned? Um, I don't know whether I necessarily had it in mind as an individual. I had it in mind as PSB. Yes. The specialist designer. Yeah. Now, um, we know that the technical submission revision six was the final version. Let's just bring that up. PSB 50214. And we can see that the revision six was actually finalized by David Harrison. It was Hugh Marnie who had done all the earlier versions. And then David Harrison, because Hugh Marnie had then left and was on gardening leave, Hugh Marnie um, finalised this. And if we look on at page three of this, section 1.12, at the bottom of the page, this is where we get paragraphs, which we, in this inquiry, we've looked at a number of times now, which set out the, the intent of the, the final system. And I think you mentioned earlier that you did ask yourself the question, because you felt you had to because of the duties to your client, whether you were satisfied that this was an adequate system. Is that correct? That is correct. <clears throat> did you ever notice that this submission didn't detail the specific scenarios that had been investigated and how the design would respond in different scenarios. So different door opening scenarios, different means of escape scenarios, different firefighting scenarios. Did you ever notice that? Um, I did not. And <clears throat> I think it, it, to some degree we were reliant on Xover as the fire engineer on the project um, and also on the, the knowledge assumed by PSB as a specialist designer that level of detail and again we were advising the client at this point we were not signing off or approving designs <clears throat> that that was JS right in this instance yes I understand um, did it concern you that PSB's technical submission didn't contain a detailed analysis of the system either comparatively with the existing system or a deterministic analysis showing the system's ability to meet certain functional requirements? Did you ever express any concern about that? Uh, 
That was, I think that was in part my reason for originally from the first text submittal that I received, revision one. That was the reason why I <coughs> forwarded that on to Xover at that point. Because as I stated in the email to Terry, it's slightly outside of my area of expertise. And with them being fire engineers, that's entirely within their area of expertise. Um, um, and then I think from, basically, I would expect ex between Xova and building control, they ought to understand yes. the, the full requirements of this system. Yes, I understand. Did it ever occur to you that there might be a risk that if a flat was on fire and the lobby was depressurized, that that might pull smoke from the fire flat into the lobby because the lobby was at a lower pressure, whether with the door shut or with the door open? Did that risk of pulling smoke into the lobby, uh, did that ever get considered by Max Fordham? I mean, that was in part my understanding of, to some degree, the function of the system. You know, and that's just how it would behave in that, in that specific scenario. I see. And was that, was that explained to you by PSB, the designers, or was that something you just gleaned looking at how the system I don't think was it written was... in the documents? I think that was my interpretation of from the documentation received from them and from my interpretation of uh, the reading that I had done around smoke extract systems during my time on the project. Was there ever any discussion about that risk and, and the magnitude of that risk in, for example, the meeting with Building Control on the 24th of uh, September 2014? Um, I don't recall, but you know, I think it was... Sorry. Sorry. 24th of November 2014. Um, I don't recall all the discussions that were taking place there but I just remember that the stair core was the primary you know the primary thing to protect in the yes. building was there any discussion about um, the extent to which conditions in the lobby would be tenable based on this system I don't believe so but again it's hard to unpack some of this just because I've been exposed to so much of it you know Yes, Since I, my time working on the project. I understand. Was there ever any discussion, including with building control, about whether there were extended travel distances and the extent to which the system was a suitable system in those circumstances? All talk of travel distances was handled between Exova as fire engineers and Studio E as architects and building control. So, to some extent, whenever travel distances were, were raised, it was clearly outside of our area of, of expertise and, and input to this project yes. unless it was, unless Xover informed us that it in some way affected the design. Yes. And I think just final point, but I think your answer may be the same. Was there ever any discussion about whether different opening door scenarios could lead to the stairs becoming com compromised? For example, if the flat door and the stair door were open at the same time? Uh, yeah, similar answer. Um, I don't recall having that conversation, but that, again, is why I wanted to, <clears throat> why I was keen to loop in Xover at all steps throughout this as fire engineers, because it's clearly within their expertise. Yes, thank you. Now, just some brief questions on um, <clears throat> commissioning and the, commission, the commissioning risk assessment and method statement, which I believe you were sent. If we just look at an email that you sent on this, MAX 406726. This is an email on the 5th of February 2016 that you sent to David Hughes of Ryden, copying in a number of others, including your client, uh, at the, clients at the TMO. And the subject is PSB Commissioning RAMS Risk Assessment Method Statement. Is that correct? That's what it refers to? Yep. And you say, Tony forwarded on the RAMS document from PSB. The system description within Section 4 is not particularly clear to me. For example, there's no mention of extracting from both shafts simultaneously or of the operation of the dampers between the smoke-rated fans and general ventilation fans. The commissioning test also does not mention the additional dampers between fans or take into account that some of the extract dampers in the lift lobbies may already be open. Could you request that PSB revise it to more accurately reflect the system installed at Grenfell? Now, can you help us, in the light of this email, was that risk assessment and method statement ever revised, so far as you were aware, to reflect the as-installed system? I 
I genuinely can't remember. Yes. Did you ever notice that the figures uh, quoted in that uh, method statement referred to a maximum pressure differential of 50 pascals? And nowhere was it mentioned that the pressure differential between the stair and the lobby would be at 25 pascals. Did you ever notice that discrepancy? I think I followed up in, an, in another email, actually, about the pressure differential and asked for, a calc asked for their reasoning behind how they arrived at the pressure differential. Yes. Which may or may not have been triggered by the fact that it wasn't a number I was expecting to see. Right. So you did spot that. Did you ever have any concerns about the commissioning process based on uh, the demonstration that you witnessed? So, okay. I'd, I'd, asked for, I'd asked for a certain amount of documentation ahead of the commissioning. Yes. <clears throat> and I asked for it a number of times. And it wasn't provided. Um, so I wasn't... When I went into the commissioning, I was already a little bit, you know, I was going into it a little bit cold, if you like. Um, but, you know, and also prior to going to the, commi to the commissioning, I had both read the British standard around, I can't remember the number, whatever it is, dash six, around press pressure differential systems, so I understood what sort of things should be, requi should be required. And I had also spoke, asked around the office as well. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. So, and I, I took away from that that it was the, the velocity across the door, the flow rate, and then, a, and then a satisfactory demonstration of the system operating between a number of different events. Um, so I came away from it being reasonably happy from a, a demonstration perspective. Yeah. The system was working. But, you know, as to, whether, as to the whether the system had been fully commissioned or not, I hadn't seen enough information at that point. And did you ever see enough information to satisfy yourself that the, the system had been commissioned so, fully and properly? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to remember what I did and didn't see at the time. I think on the day I was probably shown a commissioning sheet by, I think it was Granville, the engineer. Mr. Partlow. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um, with a number of flow rates on it and velocities. Um, yeah, I can't remember. Yeah. I, I, think, I think I saw that on the day. Um, yes. and, was, and was reasonably happy by the fact that he'd actually been and, and yes. taken these measurements. I see. Yeah. Yes. You say in your statement that you, you don't think the data was ever sent to you, but you, you said you recalled seeing something on site during the demonstration of the smoke ventilation yeah. system. So you were seeing his, his annotations on, yeah. on schedules and drawings, yeah. and that satisfied you that it was being commissioned properly, yes? Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't say I was 100% you know, it wasn't necessarily what I was expecting to see as a full commissioning. Yes. Um, again, we were advising the client at that point. We were not signing the system off. That was JS Wright <clears throat> and Ryden and ultimately building control being happy about it. Um, but from a demonstration perspective, I walked away from it being comfortable that the system operated as it should. And did you go back and advise your client that you hadn't seen what you would have expected to see for a full commissioning process? I don't recall... Um, the, I, th I think the client was CC'd, or certainly the client's representative, the employer's agent, I'll tell you, was it CC'd on our requests to PSB for the commissioning data ahead of the, ahead of the, uh, the yes. demonstration. But, yes. Yeah. Finally, were you ever sent any information about the type of dampers that they were proposing to use? For the system, the Gilbert Series 54 dampers, which were used at levels 3 to 23. Are those the ones in the lobby itself? Yes. Uh, yeah, they were within the technical submittals. They're mentioned there, but were you ever sent any technical the data information? Sheets, about the data sheet is within the technical submittal pack. And did you look at those, at those data sheets? Yeah. And did you ask yourself the question whether they were certified to the correct standards? Um, I recall that on the, on the data sheet itself, it says suitable for smoke ventilation systems for high-rise buildings are words to that effect basically and, and mentions at least one British standard one relative one relevant British standard on there so I think I looked at it read that statement saw that it referred to a British standard that I you know would have, would have assumed to see on there and then was comfortable with it okay thank you Mr Chairman, I've come to the end of my pre-prepared prepared right. questions <clears throat> we could therefore have um, a break
I think 10 minutes ought to do it, oughtn't it? Sounds like 10 minutes, we think. Yes. Yes. Based on what we've received so far, we think 10 minutes will be fine. Good. Thank you. Um, Mr Crossmith, when Council gets to the end of her questions, we have to have a short pause to enable her to check that she hasn't left anything out. And there are other people following the proceedings who may want to suggest questions that ought to be put to you. So we'll uh, break now. We'll come back at 25 to 5. Okay. And at that point, we'll <coughs> decide whether... The, well, we'll find out, rather, whether there are any more questions for you. Okay. And uh, with any luck, there won't be too many. We'll see. All right, would you like to go with the usher, then, please? Thanks. Thank you. All right, 25 to 5, then, please. Thank you.
Yes, would you ask Mr. Cross Smith to come back in, please? Okay. Right, Mr. Cross Smith, well, we'll see if there are any more questions for you. Okay. Maybe not many. Yes, just one. Thank you. Um, can I ask you this? Did you understand that when PSB was sent your technical ventilation analysis, um, there were two revisions, revision A or B, dated May 2014, the document we looked at earlier with the different flow rates in, did you understand that in sending that to PSB it was an instruction only to focus on flow rate and bettering the flow rate from the old system rather than not trying to make the system as good as possible? In the first instance, I'm not sure whether we sent that to PSP. So that would be my first point. Yes. I'd have to check naturally, but they certainly wouldn't have been on my list of who I would send that document to. No. I, don't think, I don't think they were actually contracted at that point. I understand that. But we know they got it because it's, it's cited at the top of each technical submission. It's one of the documents that they refer to as well as the employer's requirements. Okay. So we do know it entered into their hands. Okay. But I accept, and that's why I phrased the question the way I did, um, it's not clear that Max Fordham sent it to them. Yeah. Um, sorry, can you just repeat the question again? Well, did you understand that to be an instruction to the designers of the system simply to focus on flow rate and bettering the flow rate of the old system rather than trying to make the system as good as possible? No, I, I don't agree with that. We, I, yeah, Just to go back, two separate two separate things, design of the system and, um, you know, and approval by building control. Yeah. I certainly wouldn't have presented that document to PSB and said, do this. Yes. Thank you. That's helpful. Thank you very All much. All right. Um, Good. It just goes to thank Mr. Matt Crossmith for coming and giving your evidence today and assisting us with our inquiries. We're very grateful. Thanks. I hope I've been helpful. Yes, well, it you. certainly has, Mr. Crossmith, and it's right that I should thank you on behalf of all the members of the panel for coming here today and giving us your evidence and taking up your time to do so. It, it is very helpful to us to hear from uh, people who've had direct involvement in these matters. So we are uh, very grateful to you for coming. Thanks. Thank you very much, and now, of course, you're free to go. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Grange. Well, that's yes, the point you. at which we close for the day, I think. It is, and we have one more smoke witness tomorrow, Mr. White of JS Wright. Good. Thank you very much. Thank 10 o'clock tomorrow, then, please. Okay.